Hello there, welcome back on the AM show. And if you're joining us, uh, you know, for the first time this morning, well, a very warm welcome to you. Thank you for making us your uh, channel of choice. Now, we're going to be discoursing on a number of matters uh, this morning, including the reopening of schools. Now, the Ghana Education Service is going to be speaking on measures to mitigate the spread of COVID-19. Yes, the spraying exercises have started and all of that, but what does the GES have to tell us on that beat? It's a one-on-one -on -one with the Deputy Director General of the GES, Anthony Boating Esquire. He's a Deputy Director General of the GES. Also on the beat of elections, uh, the petition out there, parliamentary candidates have been challenging results in the Techiman uh, South uh, constituency. We're going to be discoursing on that matter as well. Tichiman South and Kentampo North to be specific. And uh, our guests, Martin Pebu, a lawyer, Justice Abdullahi, also a lawyer. They're going to be walking us through what we need to know with regard to uh, these petitions. But don't you forget, the AM show is brought to you courtesy of Elegant Homes and General Construction Limited, a wholly owned Ghanaian company with over 15 years experience. Our affiliate company, Elegant Home Products Limited, fabricates and sells high quality UPVC windows and door profiles from Turkey, plasterboards, cornices, gypsum adhesives and accessories. We have luxury residential properties in prime areas such as East Legon, and we also construct properties in other parts of Ghana. Elegant Homes is now selling three, four, five bedroom executive detached houses in its gated community, Elegant Courts at Katamanso, off the Adenta Dodowa Road, uh, right here in Accra. The project has solar street lights, underground sewer systems, 24-7 security, tarred roads, constant flow of water, estate management services, and a recreational area with a tennis court, playground, swimming pool, and mini shops. Clients have the option of choosing from a wide range of architectural designs and have it modified for them. You can also request for tailor-made services where we build to suit your individual taste. Our houses are built to the highest standards and we ensure that the finest of materials are used to give you excellence, luxury, beauty and value for your money. Our properties can be located in East Legon and Elegant Courts at Katamansu. So the call numbers 0244-699-053, 0248-974-428. Alternatively, you can call 0576-597-4. One nine. Elegant courts, you need to check them out, give them a ring and get that dream home you've been looking for. Now on the beat of the post-electoral petitions, parliamentary candidates, as I intimated earlier, in the Tichiman South and Kintampo North constituencies have been, uh, you know, discoursing on this matter. It's become a court issue. Joining us for that discussion, uh, Martin Pebu, who's actually a lawyer, and Justice Abdullahi, also a lawyer. Well, let me say a very good morning uh, to these two gentlemen who actually uh, join us. So let's start with uh, Mr. Kwebu. Mr. Kwebu, a very good morning. Thank you for joining us on the AM show. Yeah, good morning, uh, Mr. Akaku, Mr. <laughs> yes, it's Yes, it's always great to discourse with you. Now, uh, as we kickstart the conversation, I would just like you to uh, share with all of us some of the latest action that has characterized this petition in court on those uh, two areas, uh, Tichiman South, Kintampo North, just to set the pace for the conversation. The, sir, I lost the time to characterize the case. So I'm saying that give us some of the underlying issues that have characterized these two petitions in recent times before we get into the nitty gritty of, you know, uh, the, the petitions themselves. Oh, I think the basic, well, I'm not sure I, uh, I quite understand. Um, you know, sometimes you have to break down the question. Is it in respect of the issue that... In respect of the two petitions, the underlying circumstances... Oh, the fact, uh, then you are going to create a gap for me because <laughs> uh, they said, as lawyers, we are not uh, what you call it uh, allowed to go into the marriage and go to it. I was telling your producer that I will shy away from that and make sure that we discuss just the law, mm. you know, because my rendition. So, this is it. when somebody goes to court, 
hear the rendition of the facts, and then the respondent will also have his own rendition. So my characterizing one way or another would be like taking sides. So I prefer to deal with just the law. Right. So let's let's do this uh, then. We, we are going to take a look at the petitions themselves, some of what uh, have been put out there. But like we saw in the case of um, the Asin North uh, issue, there's been some talk about the member of parliament, or at least the contender from the NDC's end, not even being qualified to have uh, participated in the parliamentary uh, race. What is your reaction to uh, that or your take on that development? That is one of the, uh, the thrusts of that uh, petition. What can you tell us in respect of that? Okay. So, basically, uh, first we encounter a law. If somebody says that Mr. X is not qualified to be an MP, what we naturally have to do is to look at what the law says. So, what does the law say? So we have the Constitution, which spells out in Article 94 the qualifying criteria for a person to be a member of Parliament. So uh, if you take the Athens uh, North one, it borders on dual citizenship, Article 94, to, right, where it says that for a person to qualify as a member of parliament, to be elected as a member of parliament, a person should not owe allegiance to any other country, which in ordinary English means that he should not be a dual citizen. Yes. So, but you know, the attempt of one, well, he started the process, but didn't find it. Uh, the process got completed. As for this legal matter, we will see when the court decides. Then, this uh, other one, we are told it has to do with issues. So, we are told that there is an issue of fraud. Now, all I can do is to once again refer to the Constitution and say what the Constitution. If somebody is convicted of fraud, then in that case, for 10 years, 10 years after the conviction, the person cannot pass as an MP. So that is the gist of the matter. But on issues of whether there is evidence that he was actually convicted at the way, then we are more competent to see. It's when they are the evidence that whether the person was really convicted. But when it comes to the law, the closest, I'm looking at the of the allegation, the closest I can find is that, okay, the person is convicted of fraud. Uh, Mr. Kebu, we, we, we keep losing you um, now and then. If you could just reiterate that point you were making. We keep losing you. I, I think the line is a bit... Um, it's not the best uh, this morning, but if you could just uh, repeat that last line that you started with. Yes, okay. I'll say that the matter of the allegations of fraud, I'm saying that the constitution. Unfortunately, the, 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 the line is still uh, poor. We're going to try to uh, get back to Martin Pebu uh, to, to get some understanding of what exactly this petition, uh, the details of the petition, Ah, but let's take a look at some of what is in that petition when it comes to Kentampo North. And um, as you can see on your screens, it's a declaration that Joseph uh, Kwame Kuma, the parliamentary candidate of the NDC, who carried the day in that election, by the way, uh, the second respondent here and on account of being disqualified by law, is not the validly elected member of parliament for the Kentampo North constituency pursuant to the parliamentary election held on the 7th of December 2020. And B that Michael Sako uh, the NPP parliamentary candidate, the petitioner herein on account of the law, ought to have been validly declared uh, winner of the parliamentary election in the Kentampo North constituency. C, uh, consequential order, as this honorable court may deem fit to make. Uh, those are some of the, the reliefs being sought. And then when you go to 20... Um, <clears throat> 
one, it talks about the petitioner intending to rely on the following. So those are what are going to be relied on the 1992 Constitution, particularly the preamble and articles 1, 1, 33, and 94. The statutes to be employed, the Electoral Commission Act, among others. And of course, as you would expect in a case like this, decided cases are going to be uh, fallen on as well, including the presidential election petition of 2012. Uh, Martin Kwebu is back on the line. Mr. Kwebu, welcome back. Now, if you could just go back a little bit, uh, and let's try the line this time to ensure that we can actually hear what you're saying. Okay. Yes. Uh, okay. The issue of uh, that somebody was convicted uh, of the offense of fraud, okay, mm -hmm. I'm saying that in that case, the Constitution provides that if somebody is convicted of fraud, then the person is disqualified from being an agent. So, and that is been carried uh, 10 years after the conviction. So, I'm trying to limit it to what the allegation of the person is for as long. Right. There are other offenses that uh, if a person commits, that person can be disbarred as well. But for now, let's limit it uh, to the Okay, so let's look at the allegation of uh, fraud. I, it is common knowledge that there are certain requirements that must be met by anybody who wants to become a member of uh, parliament. And so can you walk us through these per what the constitution itself says, even as we delve into the matter of fraud and what the implications are if proven? Yeah. So the person application, as I said, on the matter of when the person is convicted, is what we said that the person cannot be, cannot put himself up as elected as a member of parliament. And that is what you call, that's 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 so let's say the person was sentenced to let's say 10 years, then after that sentence 10 years, you wait another 10 before the uh, restriction takes away. Okay. But that for fraud, even election offenses, they also bring about the same competition. So if somebody has a book, this is a ballot form, okay, if somebody We also know that, yes, the allegation of fraud was made against the candidate of uh, the NDC purported by uh, this petition. But what is the effect of an appeal, uh, you know, on, on such a, a decision by uh, the courts? Because, indeed, if an appeal is put through and if it is effective, if it, if it is upheld uh, by the courts, what would be the impact of that? Would it, would it make whoever had been, you know, given this or, or convicted, so to speak, of fraud, would it change anything and now allow them uh, to contest for something like a parliamentary seat? No, that's very true. Even uh, after the appeal, they are still going to be able to contest for the parliamentary seat. Because the criminal record with winning his appeal, it means that he has not committed the crime. I know it's not happening. Yeah, but they have used the evidence for speech. And so the high court or court is that, depending on which court convicted him, if he was convicted in the high court, he takes his appeal to the court of appeal. If he was convicted in the circuit court, he takes his appeal to the 
high court. So let's just say the court that has treated him on that subject. Once that is done, then he gives an all clear. Yeah, he gives the all clear so he can go ahead and contest. Yes. Right. Now, uh, the Tachiman South issue is also another uh, case in point, and of course there a number of issues have come up, even with regard to the counting uh, process and everything tied uh, to that. The thrust of the petition then would be what uh, for you, Mr. Kwebu? Okay, so we'll, we'll, we'll get back to... Um, uh, Martin Pebu on that beat. I just wanted us to quickly segue into the um, Techiman South constituency and its issues. But let's take a quick look at what uh, that petition uh, has. So if we take a look there, um, looking at the, the different pointers, that for the purpose of voting at the parliamentary election, and, and these are the uh, you know, the, the, the requests in there, the, the second respondent divided the Tichiman South constituency into 265 polling stations and the petitioner, as well as the first uh, respondent, had polling agents at each of the polling stations who signed copies of the declaration contained in Form 8A of CI-127, here and after referred to as pink sheets, which the second respondent made available at each polling uh, station. Then, that prior to the 7th of December 2020, the second respondent had conducted special voting for a certain category of voters who would be performing election-related duties on the 7th of December 2020. And for this purpose, the second respondent assigned two polling stations to the Techiman South constituency. Again, that the total tally of votes for determining the winner of the parliamentary elections conducted by the second respondent at the Tichiman South constituency therefore came from 267 polling stations, that is two polling stations um, from the special voting exercise and 265 polling stations from the regular voting conducted on the 7th of December 20. 20. So it goes on and on, but let's let's get into the nitty gritty with um, Martin Pebu, who's back on the line. Hopefully, you've been able to position better this time, so we can hear you uh, better. So welcome back. Um, so I was talking about the Tichiman South issue. There, there there are quite a number of things to look at. The fact that um, some polling stations supposedly their results were not factored in. The fact that uh, counting perhaps did not follow all the proce procedures that ought to have been followed. We've heard from the NDC side claiming uh, that even certain details they had to be given by the Electoral Commission's officials were not given them. What is the thrust uh, from what you've read in the Techiman South constituency petition, Mr. Kwebu? Well, this question is perhaps to modify a case. I want to actually modify it because when allegations uh, start in a petition, mm. because the other side has not come, mm. or better so, because the client responded, so we are yeah. very careful that to run away what the petition is going to be said as a possible. So I'm a bit uh, restricted in that uh, regard. Mm. Maybe here yeah, again, yeah, Okay. Can you at least break down for us what this means? The sort of points that are made in the petition. What what is the breakdown? What is the understanding? Break it down for us to bite size pieces. Can you do that? Yeah. Okay. So basically, you say. The CI-127, mm. which we use for the election, has procedures that have to be uh, adhered to when it comes to counting, sorting out, and declaring somebody uh, winner of the parliamentary election. So basically, 
we are looking at the regulation 43. When the matter came up, at least at the time that both sides had the opportunity to respond, we could see that the issue had to do with how regulation 43 was applied. Number one, you see that under regulation 43, it's required that when the counting is being done, they have to fill in certain forms. Mm -hmm. Okay? So now, when the forms are filled in, then the party agents are allowed to sign. After all, if you don't want to sign, then you can put in a protest. Mm -hmm. After that, there are other forms that the returning officer at the constituency collision center has to fill in and post at the constituency collision center to show that. Mr. X or Mr. Y won the election. Mm -hmm. So the time to start, if you see that, at least so far, the EP has not been able to show that the reform were still the all right. Let, let, let's let's also hear from Justice Abdullahi, uh, who joins the conversation. Justice, a very good morning to you. Thank you for joining us on the AM show. Very good morning to you and your listeners. Right. So let's start with um, where I, I just uh, ended, so to speak, with uh, Mr. Kwebu. The, the Techiman South constituency. I'm sure you've seen the petition. And uh, there are quite some points that are made uh, with regard to the counting process, with regard to the number of constituencies, with regard to what the EC should have done uh, for some of the parties, especially with the NDC, which supposedly were not done. Your initial take? Um, it, for me, it, um, these, all these revelations um, uh, are quite revealing. Um, I, I, I am shocked as to how all these could happen um, mm. when the polling agents and other observers, including the media, were all present um, during the collision and all for the entire processes of the election. Mm. Um, um, I, 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 tend, I keep asking myself, what happened to all the um, um, advice by the Supreme Court and indeed the leadership of the NDC in particular, um, when the Supreme Court had to say that elections are won at the polling station? And um, I, I, it, I, I feel we tend to take things for granted in, in a lot of ways. However, um, that does not absolve the Electoral Commission from responsibility. Uh, I think if, if, even if you were to hold an election without the, the presence of, of polling agents and party agents and all other observers um, who are traditionally present, mm -hmm. I think the Electoral Commission still owes us a responsibility under the Constitution, particular Article 296, to be fair, candid, and indeed um, not show any form of bias towards any other person. Um, they, we understand they do good and they are human beings. But once you are playing the role of a referee, I mean a referee you are expected to play that role um, to the best of your abilities in accordance with the constitutional provision and not to do it with some form of bias or the, 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 the semblance of it. And um, to that extent, I think um, we are not helping each other. We, we are supposed to help build um, confidence in the system, and we can do this better if we are able to demonstrate to all and sundry that with or without the presence of observers, um, we will still discharge our responsibilities in accordance with the Constitution of the Republic of Ghana. And indeed, for that matter, deepen the democracy that we are all seeking to build and, and ensure that in, in um, t um, years to come, with or without the presence of any other person, we can still um, um, repose confidence in ourselves and indeed in the people who have entrusted us with responsibility to operate the system we do operate. Justice, do yeah. you feel the umpire in this situation, uh, specifically the Electoral Commission, did not act above the board in Techiman South uh, on the back of some of the things that happened? Yes, the parties have to be proactive, and some have said that maybe the NDC did not take stock of certain things that it should have as a party, but are you suggesting then that the Electoral Commission itself did not do the right things in Techiman South, for which reason it, it bears some of the onus, uh, you know, with regard to all that has happened there? I have already um, 
made my clear condemnation of the electoral commissioner's conduct in this particular election. Mm. Um, that it's been the, uh, the worst form of commission since the inception of the 1992 constitution. Mm. And most of these litany of complaints are, are, are the reasons that attest to this condemnation of the electoral commission as the president. Mm. Um, and, um, and I also say this also because, as I've already noted, um, the Electoral Commission is not put there to, to do the bidding of any person. They are, um, the way they are set up the authority is also um, the means through which they, they, they repose confidence in the system. And so if these minor complaints, which are completely unwarranted, they are unwarranted in any way because um, these are not so difficult as to do. We have we voted more than a hundred million dollars in um, uh, as, as the budgetary support of the electoral commission. They have all the human resources, the material resources, and indeed the the, the complement of other things that they would need to discharge a, a, a quality um, electoral system. And so, if these minor complaints would be the basis for anybody to challenge the commission's decision, then clearly they've not lived up to expectation, which is why I condemn them in in, in no uncertain terms. And I would say that they have brought this onto themselves. This could have been avoided. These are not the kind of things that you should be seeing in the 21st century electoral commission. They are far better than that. We could do better. That's the whole point I'm making. Let, let me ask you this. I mean, we've had incidents where electoral results have been questioned. In fact, in 2012, we had that entire petition lasting about eight months and, you know, well, affecting governance in some way. But, but the point to be made is that we have had petitions in the past. People have had grievances that have been taken to court. So would, would it be fair then to look at these pockets of incidents in some constituencies, which we almost always see anyway in terms of our electoral process, and say and, and, and describe this electoral commission as the worst? Do you feel that is fair? Absolutely. And, and, and indeed, it just, it just added to my response. To the extent that we've had experiences in the past and, 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 and the Supreme Court gave us a lot of, a lot of advice to, to, to take going forward. Mm. And, and then the this Electoral Commission, but the Commissioner in, uh, in particular, mm. was part of the entire processes leading up to series of reforms. And, and, and notwithstanding all the, the wealth of experience that um, the Electoral Commissioner in particular brought on board, and the learnings that we ought to have taken from, from the 2012 um, petition, together with all the other errors that we've committed in the past, way back from um, 1996 when the, um, one of the, um, possibly um, the earliest um, electoral petition was filed by George Amo, um, that, that's, uh, I think the IELTS West Wagon constituency. Um, I think there were a lot of experiences that, I mean, put together um, should lead us to a better path. And if we are not learning from this, clearly, it is justifiable for anyone, not just as a start to lie, to condemn this electoral commissioner, um, in fact, the commission, as the worst form of the commission that we probably have. After the declaration of results, was there any window, do you feel, for the electoral commission to have remedied the situation before it went to court? Unfortunately, um, the moment um, you, you, you publish your results, um, uh, particularly after a gazette, um, there's, a, there's very little room for you to, to remedy the, the, the situation. In particular because um, at the same time you want to um, form of engender some confidence in the system. So you know if you want to temper where the result has declared. And that is what we we, we, we sought to condemn even in the um, earlier attempt to correct the results that were declared on the 9th of the December. Um, except that, well, um, with that correction, um, much as it was a minor correction, our position is that some of those things should not be happening. It shouldn't even happen at all. And, um, and, and, and this is because the whole election system um, um, thrives on trust. It thrives on trust. So if there's no trust, there's no basis for, for, for a referee. But the whole essence of having a referee is to, is, is to ensure that um, everybody, all stakeholders, um, support that referee um, because the referee reposes trust and, and, and reason, this level of trust also resonates in the people. And so if it doesn't exist, then there's no point. So any attempt to correct errors after the declaration 
would not promote that level of trust that we see. And unfortunately, I do not think the Electoral Commission, even beyond the level of trust, needs to even go the extent of um, attempting to correct any error that they might have committed itself. I think it should allow the system to operate naturally, where a party who is aggrieved should um, proceed to the appropriate um, legal firm to, to remedy that error. That way, I mean, if the Electoral Commissioner is ordered to effect that error, um, some amount of confidence would also be built in the external system, that i.e. the judiciary. That way, so we have a complement of um, trust and the deepening of, um, deepening of um, the constitutional bodies among others. Um, it is a better way of resolving disputes than the Electoral Commissioner itself attempting to correct what they deem to be an error. Otherwise, if you claim that A is an error, the question is, what about B? What about C? What about B? If A, right. B, C are all errors, then to what extent are we sure that even what you have declared is correct? Justice, uh, very briefly, I just want to uh, bring in this bit before we wrap up. Now, in the in the Kintampo North issue, it, it said that this person had been accused, you know, charged with fraud at some point and shouldn't have even have been contesting. I believe in Asin North, it was uh, another issue of someone who supposedly uh, was not qualified uh, because of the person's dual nationality. And we've seen all of these issues come up. I just want you to uh, digest for us. Is, is it the, the party that ought to be checking to ensure that the candidates it's putting uh, forward qualify? Or is it the Electoral Commission? Or are both of them culpable? Because we see some of these incidents. If it turns out that indeed the people were not fit to even partake in the elections, where do we lay the blame? Unfortunately, I think all the stakeholders, it's not just the Electoral Commission or the political party, mm. even the candidate himself mm. has a responsibility to himself to ensure that at the time that he's filing to contest an election, mm. he's fit, qualified, and indeed within the requirements of the law to contest that election. Mm. Um, because, of course, he spends a lot of money and time. I can understand why some people may want, not want to disclose some of these things or renounce their citizenship or revoke any um, form of um, allegiance that they have to an another country. Um, that's because mostly we've noticed that most of these persons, um, candidates, um, the allegiance they owe to other countries are uh, as economic in nature. And so they would want to weigh the options, whether they win or lose, before they take that decision. If they lose, then they, um, at least they can still go back to their economic um, powerhouse as a country and then recoup their losses in a way. And so there's that difficulty on the part of the candidate to, to do this renunciation before they contest. However, um, if you do not do it on time, this is a problem that um, you bring onto yourself and to your political party, and indeed to externally to the entire country as a whole, because really would have lost it, a quality resource, human resource, for nothing, simply on the basis of um, permutations and calculations and predictions that probably um, the person attempted to, uh, to undertake in order to determine whether or not you, I mean, denounces, I mean, renounces or not. Um, but I, in, um, to, the electoral, uh, to the political party, naturally they also have a responsibility to ensure that the candidate that they are filing for, um, is a candidate who is qualified, fit and qualified to 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 contest the election. What, what we have to remember is that um, the issue of nationality is, 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 is there. Are, there are two limbs of it. They are not. It's not just one aspect. It's not just I mean being a Ghanaian or not a Ghanaian. It's also so. There could be a time where uh, what we, I mean. I think all of us should know is that um, if you read the constitution carefully, it, it has two tests on the issue of. What, what nationality. The first test is whether or not indeed the person is a Ghanaian or not. The second test is owing allegiance. At that moment, you could be a Ghanaian, but you can still be, you can still be um, den um, denied um, 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 your um, candidature if it turns out that indeed you owe allegiance to another country. And this would normally happen where, for instance, a Ghanaian um, example, a Ghanaian is possibly a spy of another country. It's a typical example of the second limb. So the person is a Ghanaian, but because he owes allegiance to another country, he cannot contest the election or cannot be a member of parliament. So I think we, um, most of the time when we look at this, this particular issue, we look at it only from the perspective of the nationality. We have to remember the second limb, that is the allegiance to the country that, um, um, that you are not, um, that you may, be an, uh, you may not be a national of. Uh, so please, let's, let's take that into consideration when we are having right. this right. discussion. Now, um, for, as for the issue of a person 
um, having uh, uh, been called by a committee or a commission of inquiry to have funded some amount of money, I, um, it's, 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 it's quite difficult to appreciate why such a candidate would think that you could hide from that, um, um, uh, that responsibility, considering the fact that uh, from the days of uh, Aguna Williams and Bidima, uh, which um, I think in the 60s or, or thereabouts, where these issues, these, this part of, it, of our law has been with us from all the way from that period, that if you have been found by a commission or committee of inquiry, you can never con I mean, guilty of any um, financial malfeasance. You cannot contest for any election, and um, particularly parliamentary, and, 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 and of course it extends to the president as well. And so if you know very well that some of these adverse findings have been made about you, I, I find it difficult as to why you would fail to disclose this and, and think that you can hide under the cloak of parliamentary immunity or some, some other immunity of a sort to protect you from um, um, being a member of parliament. I, that can never happen. And so I... Um, like I said, the candidate, the political party, and indeed the Electoral Commission, they all have responsibility to do more due diligence on these persons because we spend a lot of money and time conducting an election. Right. Parties themselves, the citizens themselves, and the political party also spend a lot of money and time. And at the end of the day, the nation loses so much right. simply because the basis of some of these people. And I think we should all be we should all be up and coming with some of these things. We should own up to our responsibility. And I'm um, be completely truthful and frank. But I am more certain that um, um, the electoral commission, with um, amount of st um, state resources at this side, could not do some of these basic due diligence on the persons who, who are who are who are filed as a candidate for election for, 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 for the purpose of elections in this country. They should be able to do more due diligence on these persons. The BNI um, now NIB is available for some of these work. Um, I can understand that the candidates may be more, but they can still do a thorough job by digging into their past and finding out whether or not some amount of um, 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 issues are involved that, if brought to, to, to the fore, can deny them the opportunity to contest for the election. Okay. Well, Justice, uh, thank you very much uh, for your time with us uh, this morning. We've been engaging Justice Abdullahi and Martin Pebu, both of them lawyers, who have tried to break down the salient issues for us with regard to these two cases, Tichiman South and Kintampo North, and the petitions, of course. Uh, the courts will determine how uh, these cookies uh, crumble, if you like. Thank you for staying with us uh, right here on the AM Show. We take a bit of a breather, and when we come back, more of those discussions that we've spoken of. We are going to have that one-on-one -on -one, uh, discussion with the Deputy Director General of the Ghana Education Service, Anthony Boating Esquire. Do stay with us.